Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello learners, so today we will discuss the same module that is evidences of evolution from the paper evolutionary biology. Under this module so far what we have discussed is the different evidences or proof in support of evolution from different branches of biology. Then we particularly focused on paleontological evidences of evolution that means how fossils prove the theory of evolution. Then in the third lecture, we talked about geological time scale. That means how fossil based stratigraphy or biostratigraphy along with the radiometric methods help us to design the geological time scale. This is the fourth lecture under this module and in this lecture, we will talk about phylogeny of horse. The term phylogeny refers to evolutionary history. So we will talk about how horse has evolved so far. I am Dr. Sudhir Verma, working as assistant professor in department of zoology, Deen Dayal Upadhyay College, University of Delhi. So in this lecture, we will learn about horse phylogeny or evolutionary history of horse. Now when I say evolutionary history, I combine various things in it. For example, when the horse evolved. As you, I just mentioned, we have discussed about geological time scale in our previous lectures. So what was the geological time when the horse evolution started, when the first fossil we found? What was the origin of that particular fossil? Then we will also discuss about where the fossils were found in terms of where the evolution started. How? How it has evolved? Whether it evolved in a straight line evolution kind of thing. That means one form gave rise to another form and so on. And that is how it changed to uh, come to the recent form of horse or it changed through different branching patterns. So depending on the pattern of evolution, what was the evolution of horse? Then we will also discuss about various transitional forms. Now when I use the term transitional forms, I mean the forms which represent characters of both the previous and the next form of a organism. For example, if A form is getting changed to B, there must be some intermediate forms which represents characters of both A and B which is called as transitional form and which actually provides us a good um, supporting evidence that there was an evolution or change from A to B and not from somewhere else. So in horse evolution also we will see various transitional forms which help us to decide that yes, this is the evolutionary chain or history of the horse. And then we will talk about evolutionary trends. Now what do we mean by evolutionary trends is, if we say an organism has evolved from its primitive forms, that means it must have changed from the primitive forms. So what are those changes that have occurred? In evolution terms, we call them as evolutionary trends. And then lastly, we'll talk about the significance of uh, horse evolution which means why we are studying the horse evolution and it is not just that they provide us with a good evidence of evolution but various phenomena various components of evolution are also exhibited by the horse phylogeny so we will discuss how in terms of evolution how the horse evolution helps us in understanding the evolutionary theories. So starting with the horse phylogeny, the first question that comes to under, uh, our mind is what in fact is a horse? So probably as a zoologist, 
you are aware of technical terms about horse but in general if we are going to discuss about something first thing is we should know about what that thing is so if we are talking about horse evolution we should know where the horse lies in terms of zoology so in terms of classification the horse belongs to phylum uh, kingdom animalia and the phylum chordata under which there is a class mammalia that it belongs to and within that class there is an order called perissodactyla now this perissodactyla order represents odd toed ungulates so ungulates which have odd number of toes that means 1 3 5 and so on and within the order perissodactyla the organisms do possess the hoof the hoofed animals you might have seen the hooves on the horses on the toes they have a horny structure which is called as hoof so that is also a characteristic of perissodactyla order within perissodactyla there is a family called equidae and within equidae there is a genus called equus which represents all the horses now as a layman what you call as a horse this is basically equus cabalus there are other horse e uh, genus members as well for example the zebra that also belongs to the genus equus the donkey that also belongs to the genus equus and so on so when we talk about phylogeny of horse we are not talking about equus cabalus only we are talking about genus equus as such which may include various type of horses then the first question is this is the zoological classification part of horse but when we say horse what are the characteristics that define the horse as such and since we are studying evolution of horse based on the fossil records so we should be aware of the characteristics which a fossil or bone of a horse represent so we will focus upon the features of horse on the basis of which one can define okay this is the bone or the fossil of the horse so horse represent a large skull with long pre orbital region in this image if you see there is a, a structure of horse shown the bony structure of horse skeleton here it is the skull and here it's a neck portion if you focus on the skull there is a large skull comparatively and this region this is the orbit region i orbital region this region is called as pre orbital region which is quite long or large in this case then if you focus upon dentition there is something called long diastema you can see this blank space this is called diastema which is the space between these teeth which are incisors and these posterior teeth which are called premolars and molars they do not have the canines so the space between these incisors and premolars is called as diastema so horses do have this long diastema there are no canines the premolars are molariform they are just like molars with deep crown crown is the structure of the teeth which is visible from outside so they do have a deep crown and all these features or characteristics are adapted for grinding so all these dentition of or the modifications or dentitions they help us is to grinding process let us discuss their teeth in a bit more detail because teeth is one of the important fossil forms they do represent a hypsodont dentition now hypsodont dentition is in contrast to what we are aware of brachydont dentition humans for example they represent brachydont dentition whereas the horses they do have hypsodont dentition let us compare the normal tooth structure tooth is com uh, comprising of pulp cavity the bone enamel part dentine and cementum and all these components are arranged in a structure of tooth in basically two parts one is called as a root of tooth and another one is called as crown now on this side you see a human tooth which is brachydont and here you see a 
epsilon tooth of a horse. You can easily make out the difference between two. The root is almost similar, but the size of crown has increased a lot in case of the horse tooth or hypsodont dentition conditions. So, this is the major difference between the brachydont and hypsodont because they do have a large crown which helps in the better wear and tear processes of horses. So, this is a hypsodont condition which is characteristic of a horse. Then moving ahead to the other bones that is the bones of forelimb or hind limbs they do have anguli grade mode of locomotion. Now anguli grade mode of locomotion is represented here. If you focus on this image there are three different kind of organisms showing different kind of locomotions are collected. In the first part, you see a bear's limb which shows the palantigrade mode of locomotion. The other one is belonging to a dog which represents a digitigrade mode of locomotion. And third one is basically of horse which represents an anguligrade mode of locomotion. Now, I would like you to focus on this shaded part only. Forget about these light bones but focus on this darkened portion or the shaded portions. You can easily identify that here the whole area is touching the ground. right? Whereas in case of dog, it is only this part. This part is above the ground. Whereas in horse, it is still lesser. Only the tip portion which we call as the hoof, only that portion is touching the ground. Rest everything is above the ground. So, where the whole thing is touching the ground is called as palantigrade. Then only this part is called digitigrade. Only the tip is called as anguligrade. So, also you can compare from bear to dog to horse in terms of running. So, as the running capacity is increasing, the fast running is increasing, they are going from palantigrade to anguligrade mode. And hence, the horses have the anguligrade. That means, one toe long foot and they have a perfect hoof as you can see here and here there is no hoof but here in case of horse there is a well developed perfect and well uh, visible hoof is there then the question comes this is fine what we are going to study we are going to study about horse evolution but the question comes why the horse evolution as an evolutionary biologist, we might be interested in studying the evolution of men. And as a zoologist, maybe we are interested in studying the evolution of various organisms. But the question is, why the horse only? There are a number of reasons why we are particularly focusing on horse phylogeny and why this horse phylogeny is very common feature of all the textbooks on evolution starting from the school days. But some of the reasons we can narrate out like this. This is because we do have a large fossil record of horses. When I say large fossil records means we do have a collection of almost all the horses which have occurred in the past. So it's a huge history of horses and we do have the fossils of almost all of them. Besides this, we have a large record of transitional forms. See, in order to say that something has evolved from these earlier stages, we must have the proof of that, that it has come this way. And these transitional forms provide us the proof of this. So, in case of horse phylogeny, the fossils which we have got, these fossils represent characters of, as I just mentioned, the previous form and the coming form. So, we do have a large record of the transitional forms as well. So, these fossil records make the evolutionary history of horse almost complete. And that is the reason it represents a very good examples of physical evidence of evolution. You must remember when we were talking about paleontological evidences of evolution, we talked about how a phylogeny of a particular organism can represent an example that fossils are the good evidence of evolution. Now, besides this, 
it represents an example of branching evolution instead of straight line. See, there can be two modes. One is A is getting transformed to B, B is getting changed to C and C is getting changed to D in a linear way. The other form can be A is getting changed to B, C and D and so on. So, it represents both the anagenesis that is a straight line kind of thing and it represents a branching offshoot that is a cladogenesis form of evolution. So, it is not just uh, proving us the evidence of evolution but it helps us to understand various phenomena of evolution as well. And that is the reason we particularly are studying horse phylogeny. When we talk about horse phylogeny, two persons came to come to our mind. First one of them is Richard Owen and another one is Othniel C. Marsh. Now these two persons have contributed a lot along with others in the understanding of horse evolution. Richard Owen was the first person who described the earliest known horse-like fossil, which now we name as Hyracotherium or Eohippus. The another person, Othniel C. Marsh, along with others, have presented various transitional stages of horse. And this history is of around 60 million years. So the horse, the first fossil which we found, it's age has been predicted to be around 60 million years old. So from these 60 million old fossil which is Hyracotherium to the modern form which is equals how the horse has evolved through various transitional stages have been presented by the Othniel C. Marsh. So that is why we are considering these two people here. Let us have a quick a summary of horse evolution. When we talk about horse evolution, we are going to talk about what was the time period when it started and what is the total duration that it has took to come to the recent form. So, in terms of geological time, as you might have remembered, in the previous lecture, we talked about geological time scale, which is the time scale based on the fossil record or biostratigraphy and radiometry. So the fossil of horse has been found that the history is dated back to Eocene epoch of Paleogene period of Cenozoic era of Phanerozoic eon. As you can see in this screenshot, there is a Phanerozoic era eon. Within that there was a Cenozoic era and within Cenozoic there were Paleogene, Neogene and Quaternary periods under which there was an Eocene epoch. So the first fossil of horse that has been found, it has been found somewhere here which is almost 60 million years old. So it has covered a long journey of 60 million years from here to here. Not just time or the geographical time but the primary center or location is important and in case of horse it has been mainly the North America from where some species spread it to Asia and European regions. The first known fossil has been named as Hyracotherium or Eohippus and they were found in the North America and Europe. So this slide gives you an overview of horse evolution. Now we will have a quick image overview of horse evolution. As you can see here in this image, which has been taken from American Natural History Museum, here on this scale you can see the geographical location. So horse evolution has taken place mainly in the South America, North American region and the Old World. When I say Old World, the Western people consider Asia, Africa and Europe in the Old World. So if you can see this history of horse, most of the evolution has taken place in this region which is belonging to the North American region. On this scale, you can see various epochs has been shown from Eocene to the Holocene or the recent epoch. So, with geological time and the geographical location, the evolution of horse has been shown here. And you can appreciate that it is not a straight line that from here to here different forms have uh, arise. 
you can see from here if this is the ancient form it has gone to this way this way this way this way so it's a sort of bushy network or branching pattern which you can observe here also you can see there are two forms one is called as grazing and another one is called as browsing forms these dark ones are the browsing one and the recent ones are the grazing ones now what is the difference between browsing and grazing ones are the Browsing ones are basically showing the herbivory, so they feed on soft vegetations and so on. Whereas the grazing one, they feed mainly on the grasses. So a layman difference can be the gra grazers are basically grass eating, whereas the browsers are non-grass eating. This is another picture of horse evolution, but the difference from the previous picture here is, besides it shows the time scale and the grazer and browsers kind of key and the different names of the transitional forms or the different uh, forms of um, horses that has occurred it shows the structures of particular uh, organs let's say the limbs four limbs and hind limbs it also shows the teeth structures also in this picture you can see with respect to each EOC, uh, sorry, epoch, you can see which form of horse was prominent or which form was present in which epoch. So, what we can understand from this picture is there are certain specific changes in different organs or structures or anatomical structures that have been associated with the evolution of horse, and these changes we term as evolutionary trends. So we need to focus upon what has been the evolutionary trends for the evolution of horse from its primitive form that is hierocotherium to equus. Let us discuss these major evolutionary trends. The first one is there is an overall increase in size or height from small dog like animal to the present dog day horse. If you compare this organism with this one you can easily make out that there has been an increase in size or height now this height or size increase could have been because of the increase in the limb size increase in the neck size and so on so a primitive form or eohippus or hierocotherium which was just like a dog like organism it has attained a better height a larger height and it has reached to the modern horse or equus. So this is one of the trend that has been associated with the evolution of horse. The second major change is gradual enlargement and better development of third digit or the median digit and reduction of the lateral digits. As you are aware that these horses belong to perisodactyla which is an odd toed ungulate so they do have digit numbers ranging from 1 3 5 and so on what change people have observed is there has been a gradual development and enlargement of the median digit or third digit so from here to here one thing is there is an enlargement of the limb as such second thing is if you see these digits let's say this is the median one from here to here, it's only the median one which is enlarging and developing better. The lateral ones, the side ones, they are getting obsolete. They are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and so on. So, the gradual enlargement and better development of third digit and the lengthening of limb along with the perfection of hoof is another important evolutionary trend associated with phylogeny of horse. And this helps in the better running in the open grasslands. Another important characteristic is the palentigrade or digitigrade mode has shifted to unguligrade. Now when once you are aware of what palentigrade and digitigrade and unguligrade are, you can appreciate that the horse have attained unguligrade mode of locomotion but it was not always the unguligrade. The earlier forms were basically the palentigrade or digitigrade, but the modern horse has 
angular grade mode of locomotion which is has it has evolved yet another differences can be with respect to skull there has been elongation of pre orbital region of skull so you know that this is the pre orbital region from here till here if you compare this is almost at the center in case of eohippus and it is being shifted backwards and that is the reason that the pre orbital region has increased in the modern forms which you see so this pre orbital region was not always like this it has evolved another thing is small to large brain with the advancement of skull size the brain size which is there inside the skull that has accordingly increased as well so the size and the complexity of brain as also has increased then there is an elongation of neck which you can prominently see across these organisms from the eohippus to modern horse then regarding dentition as i just said the brachydont to hypsodont dentition changes the modern form is hypsodont in nature but the earlier forms or the primitive forms of horse evolution they were not always the hypsodont they were basically brachydont so if you see this chart with is with respect to geological time scale and the evolution of horse from hyracotherium to equus the equus has grazing teeth which is high crown and with cementum the teeth which were present in hyracotherium they were browsing type with low crown and no cementum so the teeth or dentition has also undergone evolution from this brachydont mode to this currently available hypsodont dentition and it is associated with a feeding habits also so these were well adapted for browsing type and this is best adapted for the grazing type of teeth besides this the premolars have become molar like so molary formation of or molary uh, form nature has been evolved from the premolars kind of condition throughout the journey of evolution of horse so besides this prominent one there has been a number of changes some of them can be the reduction in the pectoral girdle and disappearance of weak clavicle also the body has become streamlined with tight muscles and without loose fat for long and sustained running stamina basically besides this the nostrils they have become wide to allow more air into strong lungs and stamina increased etc so these are additional changes which have been seen in the evolutionary history of horse